Well, in the course of our time in the book of Jonah, we've seen God's truculent prophet Jonah in flight from God, in peril on the high seas, in the dock, interrogated by his fellow seafarers, in the depths, both physically and spiritually, and most recently, where he should have been in the first place, in Nineveh. And the word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time, and he obeys it, he goes to Nineveh, and something amazing happens in this city of great wickedness, where cruelty and barbarity were national pastimes. Spiritual revival breaks out. And there's compelling preaching, there's belief, there's penitence, and there is state-sanctioned repentance. The king of Nineveh orders 40 days of prayer, fasting and repentance. And we saw last week how deeply the king was affected when the word reached him that there had been a mass outbreak of contrition among his subjects. And we saw last week that he was a follower. He followed his people's example of penitence. But we also saw that he was a, a leader. He showed his people the way in terms of humility and contrition. He got off his throne. He took off his royal robe. He put on sackcloth. And he sat in ashes to convey his destitution and poverty. He had nothing to offer the God of Israel to avert the doom coming upon him and his people. He placed no obligations on his people. He wasn't prepared to carry himself. If they went without food, so would he. If they bore the discomfort of sackcloth, so would he. But we saw last week also that he was a sage. He took the view, who knows? God had said, not doom now, but doom in 40 days' time. Perhaps God, in his anger, seeing the true repentance among the people, each one turning from his evil way, well, he may relent of the disaster he had declared he would bring on them. And the view that the king took proved to be very astute. God did in respond to their repentance and judgment did not fall upon the city. But at the beginning of chapter 4, we get a surprise. And we are shocked to read that Jonah did not respond to God's display of mercy as we might have expected. Instead of seeing Jonah in high spirits, we see him in high dudgeon. Jonah is out of sorts. He's miserable. As we might put it today, he's seriously hacked off. Now there's much in these three verses to teach us about our fallen human condition. Even if we've been Christians for, for decades and have made at least a, a few faltering steps forward in the life of faith. So I've got four brief headings for you this evening. And firstly, we see in verse 1, Jonah the sulk. Jonah the sulk. Now go back in your mind, if you can, 40 or 50 years, and to the days of the tent missions. The days of the tent missions. It's the summer of 1976, and a crowd of several thousand has gathered to hear an evangelist preach the gospel. You know, the evangelist would have given his right arm to have received the sort of reception to his message that Jonah did. He would have been overjoyed. He would have rejoiced with the angels in heaven, not just over one sinner who had repented, but over the thousands of sinners who had repented. So the word Jonah preached had fallen on good soil, and it had produced a good crop. But instead, we read that Jonah was angry. The mass outbreak of repentance displeased him. He's, it seemed wrong to him. It seemed an injustice that these animals, these animals should be spared the repercussions of God's righteous anger. And Jonah was a sourpuss. He was son and he was a sulky saint. 
after his defeat in 1975 to Margaret Thatcher and the loss of his position as leader of the Conservative, Par the Conservative Party, former Prime Minister Ted Heath was nicknamed rather unkindly by a critic as the Incredible Sulk. And it was, uh, I think it was a play on words of the TV series of the 1970s, The Incredible Hulk. And that, we could safely say, was Jonah, the incredible salt. You know, there is perhaps nothing more dispiriting in the Christian life than to be in the company of a sulky saint. This Christian has much really to be thankful for. They've been richly blessed. They've been showered with the love of God in Christ. But for some reason, sullenness and perhaps even self-pity has set in. Nothing is ever right for them. They're always complaining. They are draining. They're a sap on your energy. They used to be a joy to be around. Now you have to endure their company rather than enjoy it. Sulky saints don't make for good adverts for the gospel. They repel rather than they attract. But that was Jonah in verse 1. Sulking and sour. You know, there is only one cure for sulkiness in a Christian, it's thankfulness. It's developing the gratitude attitude. It's consciously remembering and naming your blessings through the grace of God. Where might you be tonight had the grace of God not intervened in your life, saved you and turned your life around? You know, dwelling on a, a favourite hymn, a piece, favourite piece of scripture when you're tempted to sulk, as we all are from time to time, you might find helpful to reconnect you with a spirit of thankfulness. It's a genuine sense of thankfulness, which is the antidote to sulkiness. Jonah the sulk. But secondly, we see in verse 2, Jonah the theologian. Jonah may have been sulking, but at least he prayed. And he took his anger and his frustration to his God in prayer. Now, the, the covenant name of the God of Israel, Yahweh, or the Lord in our Bibles, has not been used since the end of chapter 2. But now it's used twice in Jonah's prayer of verse 2. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Jonah, despite all his petulance, despite his bad temper, despite really his childishness, still knows his God. And he knows the character of of his God. He knows the nature of his God. He knows the graciousness of his God, the compassion of his God, the patience of his God. And we have that lovely Hebrew word here, hesed. Hesed. We thought about it before. Steadfast love. Jonah knew that the God of Israel's love was not capricious, not fickle, not erratic, not unreliable. It was constant, unchanging. As the sun rose every morning and set again in the evening, so did God's hesed, steadfast love. So Jonah, the, the theologian, is spot on. He's a good theologian. He knows the truth about his God because he knows his God. Now, if I, if I can take you back, I'm sure you remember it, to our first sermon in May, in Jonah, and we asked ourselves the question, well, why did God attempt to flee from, why did Jonah attempt to flee from God to Tarshish in the first place? And then we made this forward leap from chapter 1, verse 3, to chapter 4, verse 2. Jonah got on a boat to the end of the then known world to escape God and his word, to go to Nineveh, because he knew in his heart that if he obeyed God and preached judgment, the Ninevites would repent, and the God who is slow to anger would relent. And he would not bring upon Nineveh the judgment the city deserved. You see, Jonah, for all his thoughts, knew his God. And he knew even before the Apostle Peter wrote it in his second letter, that his God was patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come 
to repentance. And this was what so disgusted Jonah. And disgusted is not too a strong a word. The English Standard Version puts it that God's display of mercy exceedingly displeased Jonah. Jonah's theology was accurate. He accurately predicted what he acted, accurately predicted about God came to pass. But Jonah's heart was not good. He was a man of passion. He was not a man of compassion. He could preach the wrath of God. He could not preach the love of God to savages such as the Ninevites were. He could count, countenance the forgiveness of God for his chosen people, Israel. He couldn't countenance it for those Gentile dogs in Nineveh. So Jonah's the, the sulky saint. He's the insightful theologian. But he's also, thirdly, Jonah the learner. There's a song in Oxford praise with these words. Grace sufficient, grace for me, grace for all who will believe. We will stand on every promise of your word. And of course that is exactly what we believe as evangelical Christians. God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is sufficient to save me. But here is the hard bit. Grace for all who will believe. You see, we become so absorbed with ourselves. We can look no further than the ends of our own noses. We are so obsessed with God's love for ourselves and our kind of people. We forget about grace for all who will believe. And that was Jonah's problem. He had been a beneficiary of God's grace. He was the one to whom the word of the Lord came the first time in chapter 1. He was the one to whom the word of the Lord came the second time in chapter 3. He had personally tasted God's grace in the belly of the fish and had confessed that salvation comes from the Lord. And thereupon the, the Lord gives the word to the fish and it vomits Jonah onto the dry land and he's saved from a slow death by suffocation. So, Jonah's knowledge of God's grace was not theoretical. It was practical. He, it, his life had literally been saved by it. It was not second-hand. It was personal. He could pray from the belly of the fish, but you, Lord, have, have brought my life up from the pit. But as his reaction to God's mercy towards Nineveh shows us, when it came to the grace of God, Jonah was not the finished article. He was not the expert. He was still very much a learner in the way of God's grace. He had an L plate strapped around his neck. He still had very much to learn. You see, he could not see the justification for the extension of God's grace beyond the borders of Israel. If he understood that salvation comes from the Lord, he would add a caveat, but only for the Israelites, only for the likes of him and his kind. But now, from verse 4 to the end of the chapter in the book, Jonah is about to receive an object lesson in God's grace. He is going to continue in the journey that is God's grace. You see, even the, the great drama of being swallowed up by a fish and then being expelled from the fish to safety was not enough to teach Jonah all there was to know about grace. Tim Keller writes this, We learn from Jonah that understanding God's grace and being changed by it always requires a long journey with successive stages. In other words, learning the way of God's grace is a process, not an event. It's not like suddenly grasping the solution to a mathematical problem and then using the formula that you have learned to solve it. No, it's more like research, a research project to gain a, a PhD. And even when you have been awarded with the doctorate, you know that there is so much more to learn in the subject that you've been researching for years. You've just been scratching at the surface of the subject. And we're all learners when it comes to grasping the heights and the depths of God's grace. And we need grace for every stage of life's journey. 
There is grace to learn when we get married. There is grace to learn for the young mother exhausted by broken nights and frustrated by the endless crying of her baby. There is grace to learn when the children reach their teenage years and they question everything, especially their parents' authority. There is grace to learn as we get older and we find that younger colleagues at work are being promoted and our career's progression has come to a grinding halt. There's grace to learn when our parents get frailer and need more care and attention. There is grace to learn if we lose them either to dementia or death. And there's grace to learn as we ourselves get older and have to live within the confines of our physical limitations. God's grace for the believer lasts a lifetime. And for the one walking like Enoch did, with his God day after day, month after month, year after year, the knowledge of God's grace gets richer and deeper. So Jonah, he'd come some way in, understanding, uh, in his understanding of God's grace, but he had still so much further to go and so much more to learn. Jonah the sulk, Jonah the theologian, Jonah the learner, and then finally we have in verse 3, Jonah the complex. Jonah the complex. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. There is no doubt about it. Jonah was a complicated individual. He was a complex man. If he had preached to a rebellious Israel and she had repented with fasting and sackcloth and ashes, he would have rejoiced. There, I'm sure, would have been a high degree of job satisfaction for him. He would have felt that he had discharged his duties as a prophet competently and faithfully. But because it was these despised Ninevites who had responded to his preaching, when he had secretly hoped that they would not, he's depressed. Depressed to the point that he asked his Lord to take him. You see, his life is of no value now. And we, we think of the prophet Elijah who said the same thing after his great victory on Mount Carmel and he was forced to flee into the desert to escape the wicked Queen Jezebel who wanted to put his head on a pole. Elijah also wanted the Lord to take his life. But at least Elijah had a reason for his despair. He was a frightened man up against a ruthless queen who took no prisoners. But Jonah had no justification for his depression. The Ninevites were not grumbling against him. They were groveling before the God of Israel. His mission, although he had hardly wanted it in the first place, had been a success. So Jonah really had no excuse. Yes, he didn't understand why Yahweh wanted to extend his grace to a, a people who took pleasure in skinning and screwing the captured, the captured leaders of the nations that they defeated. But now the city had repented of its lust for cruelty. But Jonah wanted to end his life just at the moment of his greatest victory. In fact, he was treating his victory as if it were a defeat. Surely, he was a complex man, a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Now, what lays behind what the commentators call the Jonah complex? Well, I think there are two things. Firstly, he longed for vindication. He longed to be vindicated by events. He longed to be vindicated by Nineveh's fall. But Nineveh did not fall, the people repented. But Jonah wanted to see a burning Nineveh as it fell into the hands of its enemies. He wanted to see the Ninevites rushing out of the city in flames and calling out to him, Jonah, you were right. Your message was true. If only we had listened to you. If only we had taken you seriously. That is what Jonah wanted. Personal vindication. He preached doom and on the 30, 41st day, doom would come upon Nineveh. But he'd been denied the pleasure of this vindication when the people put on sackcloth and fasted. And so he felt that his credibility had been compromised. 
You see, he valued his reputation as a no-nonsense preacher, and that had been tarnished when the hand of judgment did not fall. But secondly, Jonah had lapsed into Phariasism. He had become like the bet noir of Jesus' day, the, the Pharisee. Jonah had hated not only the sin of the Ninevites, he'd hated the Ninevites. And it has been noted by the commentators that Jonah in chapter 1 is like the younger son in the parable of the prodigal, but by chapter 4 he comes across as the older brother, beside himself with rage at his father's generosity of spirit towards the son who had squandered the family wealth from prostitutes. So Jonah was a strange kettle of fish, longing for personal vindication with the same disdain for sinners the Pharisees had in Jesus' day. But we're all Jonas, aren't we? And Jonah is a Christian life, type of Christian life after all. There was a Jonah complex, there's a Kevin complex, there is the complex that you are. We may be Christians, but we're all complicated human beings. And we have, in Paul's words to the Corinthians, this treasure in, in jars of trade. The treasure of Christ, the, the gem that is the gospel, and the witness of the Holy Spirit. They're not housed in costly porcelain vase, but in, a, but in a common clay jar. We're complicated. Martin Luther used to lament that after a period of fruitful Christian service, he would suddenly be assailed by sinful thoughts and desires. And he described the experience as the devil riding on my back. Paul spoke of the conflict of his two natures of sin, of spirit and self. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Jonah was not straightforward, and neither are you or I. But it's with these complex materials that Jesus builds his church. So, at the beginning of chapter 4, it takes us by surprise, doesn't it, at the beginning. Jonah's not rejoicing, he's resentful. Jonah the sulk, he, he's bitter towards Yahweh. But he's also Jonah the theologian who understands correctly the character of God. But he shows he's no thoroughbred when it comes to understanding the depths of God's grace. Jonah is the, the learner with an L plate around his neck. And Jonah, the complex, is what we all are. A combination, a complex combination of values, motives, desires and emotions. You see, the grip of self was still strong in Jonah. And his reputation as a fire and brimstone preacher had been undermined by the grace of God. And he took it personally. He was still not willing to make himself of no reputation. In fact, his reputation meant everything to him. Jesus would be the prophet Jonah should have been. Jesus would be the one who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but who made himself of no reputation. And in two weeks' time, we will see Yahweh take Jonah back into the classroom and teach him some more about his grace to undeserving sinners. Amen.